Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Today we're going to talk about one of the highest paid and most famous actors of the early 20th century. I know we've been on kind of an entertainment kick lately. <laughs> that was totally accidental. Yep. Uh, so this particular actor acted alongside Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, and Rudolph Valentino. He was friends with Charlie Chaplin. He had a Broadway theater named after him, and he was one of the first movie stars to build his own mansion in Los Angeles. But his name is not nearly as familiar today as all those other stars that I just mentioned, because what made him famous was his skill at female impersonation, which fell increasingly out of favor later on in his career. He is Julian Elting. And in 1950, almost a decade after his death, he was still being described as the greatest of all impersonators of women. And a one note that I do want to make about how to say his name. There are numerous print sources from when he lived that insist that it was pronounced Elting. Like, with a hard G. But there is a lot of old footage uh, floating around, as well as more recent footage of people talking about him where people say it Eltinge. And apparently, he picked the stage name on purpose because of the potential for mispronouncing it, thinking that it would, quote, serve to fix it more firmly with the public. <laughs> uh, so just, we're just going to go with Elting. I mean, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> for example, my name gets mispronounced all the time, but uh, to me it's fun because my maiden name was very boring and no one ever <laughs> messed it up. <laughs> So I'll answer to Frey, Fry, Free, any of those work fine. Well, um, and I definitely never saw any footage of everybody of anybody saying, Welcome, Julian Eltinge. And right. being like, that's not how you say that. I mean, I, I want to say Eltinge just reading it because there's an E on the end. Right. But no. So for today it's Elting. Mm-hmm. And Julian L. Ting was born William Julian Dalton, known as Billy, on May 14, 1881. Some sources report it as 1883, though, so just know that if you go looking. He was born to Michael and Julia Baker Dalton in Newtonville, Massachusetts. Today, Newtonville is one of the villages that makes up the city of Newton. Four days after his birth, he was baptized at Our Lady Help of Christians Catholic Church. From there, Elting's story about how he got into show business immediately gets fuzzy, just from moment one. According to some sources, the family moved west in pursuit of the gold rush not, not long after he was born. They headed to California first, and then they backtracked to Butte, Montana. So 1881 would have been well after the peak of the gold rush in California, but Butte was in its mining heyday right around then, so that might make a little bit of sense. When he failed to make it as a prospector, though, Michael Dalton started working as a barber. In this version of the story, Julia Dalton encouraged the young Billy to dress up and entertain patrons at nearby saloons. But when his father caught him dancing in a dress, he beat him as punishment and then sent him back to Boston to live with an aunt. The other most common version of Billy's early life is that at the age of 10, he got a part in the cadet theatricals, and these were all male performances that were staged by the First Corps of Cadets. The First Corps of Cadets was a volunteer militia connected to Boston's upper class. A lot of its members were Harvard graduates with their own all-male theater experience in the form of Harvard's hasty pudding theatricals. The cadet theatricals were staged for fundraising purposes, in this case to pay for the construction of an armory that still stands today as the castle at Park Plaza in, Bos in Boston. I found numerous references to the fact that the reason they needed to an armory is because they were afraid of an immigrant worker uprising, and I went looking for exactly what that was, I mean, other than just the tone of the time. Like, was there a specific thing that prompted them to need to build a giant castle-like armory because of the threat of immigrant worker uprisings? I did not go far enough down that rabbit hole to answer it while writing <laughs> this podcast. But as the story goes, young Billy stole the show so thoroughly that the group started writing parts just for him. So regardless of which of those stories is closer to the truth, 
Uh, It does seem that by 1895, at the age of 14, Billy Dalton was in Boston working at a dry goods store. And in 1900, he definitely did have a role in the Cadets Theatrical's uh, production of Milady and the Musketeer, which was a parody of the Three Musketeers. He had been taking dance classes with Lila Vales Wyman, who ran a dance school above Boston's Tremont Theater. She had, rec- she had recommended him to Robert Barnett, who did everything from writing to producing with the cadet theatricals. I have a question. Yep. Is there any possibility that these variant stories of his background were maybe seeded by him, the person who also chose a name that could be pronounced differently to set himself in people's minds. That is likely. (laughs) Um, And there's, I mean, there's also, I mean, there's stuff that, as I was researching this, there would be lines in in papers that were like, you should take all of this media coverage with a grain of salt because a lot of this, like, entertainment reporters would just make up quotes from people. (laughs) Nice. By this point, working with the cadet theatricals, Billy Dalton had already started going by the name Billy Elting, having borrowed the surname of a childhood friend. He wasn't a member of the first corps of cadets or a Harvard graduate, even though later publicity would claim that he had gone to Harvard. Nevertheless, he was cast as Mignonette. And this may be where the discrepancy in his birth year comes from. He was about to turn 19, but the rest of the cast thought he was more like 15 or 16. Milady and the Musketeer raised $25,000 to help pay off the mortgage on the first Corps of Cadets' giant castle-like armory, and the show was generally praised. Elting's performance in particular was very well-reviewed, with some Boston papers saying that he was a better dancer than the man in the lead female role. The next year... Barnett was staging a show for the Bank Officers Association. Like the first Corps of Cadets, the Bank Officers Association staged all-male reviews to raise money, in this case for a fund to help its members if they became ill or disabled. The play was Miss Simplicity, and Barnett wrote the role of Claire de Loinville for his rising star, Billy Elting. Here is how the Boston Evening Transcript reviewed this performance. Quote, As in the cadet theatricals, one had here fresh proof of how bewitchingly, intoxicatingly beautiful a young man can be in girls' clothes. Anything more unsettling than Mr. Elting's Claire de Loinville were hard to imagine. Even his veiled baritone voice had the perturbing, velvety charm of a rich, subdued contralto. There was not an item in his whole appearance, look, manner, and action that was not delusively feminine. Looking into a mirror, he might, like Narcissus, fall in love with himself. (laughs) That reviewer seems almost angry at how good a female impersonator (laughs) he is. Miss Simplicity brought in $10,000 for the Bank Officers Association. In 1903, they put on Baron Humbug, described as a Hungarian musical play, with Elting cast in the role of Countess Sylvia. Although the show itself drew mixed reviews, Elting's performance was once again highly praised. The Sunday Herald called it a revelation, and its reviewer wrote, quote, one almost wondered if the bank officers had not secured a remarkably attractive actress to play the role. At this point, Billy Elting was well-known in Boston and to some extent outside of it because some of the shows that he was in would sometimes go on tour after the end of their Boston run. But after his performance in Miss Simplicity, he got a chance to go on Broadway. And we will talk more about that after a sponsor break. After the Boston run of Miss Simplicity closed, composer and producer Edward E. Rice hired Julian Elting, who by now had dropped the name Billy, to appear on Broadway. The show was Mr. Wicks of Wickham, and it opened at the Bijou Theater on September 19, 1904. In his role of John Smith, Elting dressed as a woman and sang a song called Not Like Other Girls. The Tammany Times called the show, quote, catchy and refined, and called Elting's performance one of its two big hits. But the New York Times called it a poor show, poorly acted, with no redeeming features. (laughs) (laughs) 
It's just like movie reviews today. Um, In spite of those decidedly mixed reviews, this was a great time for Elting to make his way to New York. Theater in New York City goes way back before the 1900s, but the theater district we now know as Broadway was just getting started in 1904. The New Amsterdam and the Lyceum were two of the earliest Broadway theaters, and they were both built in 1903. In 1904, Longacre Square was renamed Times Square after the New York Times opened its office tower at the intersection of 42nd and Broadway. The Times Square subway station opened that year as well, and theaters started relocating from the Union Square and Madison Square Garden areas to this newly booming district. By 1910, thanks to all the newly installed electric lighting, this stretch of Broadway would be called the Great White Way. Vaudeville was also thriving in New York at this time. Both vaudeville and American burlesque had roots in the minstrel shows that had been popular in the United States from the early 19th century uh, through the years after the end of the Civil War. In minstrel shows, white actors in blackface put on acts that lampooned and stereotyped Black people, sometimes lifting the work of Black playwrights and songwriters to do it. Although women eventually became a bigger part of minstrel performance, especially in the earlier years, women's roles were usually played by men. Minstrel, vaudeville, and burlesque shows all had some elements in common, but with a very different theme and tone. By the time that minstrel shows fell out of favor, female impersonation and male impersonation were both part of vaudeville and burlesque. Vaudeville impersonators were often very careful to frame their acts as wholesome family entertainment, while burlesque impersonators sometimes took a more satirical or titillating approach. Elting had made his vaudeville debut at B.F. Keefe's Theater in Boston, and he continued his vaudeville performances as he was becoming more well-known in New York. Female impersonators in general tended to be some of vaudeville's highest-paid performers, and Elting was one of the highest-paid among them. For his act, he put on a corset, dresses, makeup, and wigs, and he wedged his feet into dainty little shoes to carry off the illusion that he was a beautiful woman on the stage. He also sang as a baritone, opting opting not to use a falsetto voice or to otherwise try to make his voice sound higher than it really was. Sometimes he'd take his wig off at the end of his performances to show the audience that he was a man. Here's how he described it. Quote, A man on the stage must make up differently than a woman. His idea is to give strong lines to his face, accent the masculine traits, and tone down whatever softer feminine lines nature has endowed him with. In my work, it is just the opposite. I must tone down the dominant masculine characteristics of my face and figure and seek to bring out those feminine lines that even the most masculine man has somewhere about him. A man does not have to worry much about the correct color of rouge or powder to go with his complexion. But with a woman's makeup, that is where you find true art. Whether it was on a more traditional Broadway theater or whether it was in vaudeville, Julian Elting and his female impersonation became enormously popular, especially among women. In the words of comedian and actor W.C. Fields, quote, women went into ecstasies over him. Men went into the smoking room. And as a side note, uh, our recent podcast subject, Windsor McKay, drew him as part of an act at the Orpheum Vaudeville Theater in Chicago. We did not mean for all of these things to interlock. We didn't. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, In fact, we had already... um, I, in my imagination, that episode had already even come out to listeners when I discovered that, but my, that's not correct. We had recorded it, but it wasn't actually released as of when we are doing this right now in the studio. So, in New York, Elting became friends with playwright and composer George M. Cohen, who wrote the song Give My Regards to Broadway. And along with a lot of other big names in show business, Cohen was a Freemason and a member of Pacific Lodge Number 233. Elting eventually joined the Freemasons as well and was able to make a lot of show business connections through the, through the Lodge. By 1907, Elting was so famous that he was able to go on a European tour to Vienna, Berlin, Paris, and London. In London, he gave a command performance for King Edward VII at Windsor Castle. The king was so delighted that he gave Elting a white bulldog as a thank you gift. 
In 1910, the fascinating widow debuted in New Jersey with Elting as the star. Otto Harbach had written the play especially for him, and it featured Elting in male and female roles, with a lot of costume changes back and forth between them. The basic premise, Elting plays a man who gets into legal trouble after punching someone in the nose and disguises himself as the eponymous fascinating widow to make his escape. Because of the huge success of The Fascinating Widow, these quick changes between masculine and feminine clothing became a hallmark of Elting's performances. I wish I had a a good grasp of the logistics of that. Yeah, I tried to figure out um, exactly, like, I tried to get a better play-by-play of how all this would go down. I am imagining there were stagehands and, and dressers and costumers helping with all of the quick changes, but I didn't find a lot of uh, discussion of that. Like, I mean, I've, you know, done enough theater that I I know how a quick change of clothing works, but it's the makeup that makes me go, hmm, after we yeah. have just heard in his own words how differently you had to do makeup for a performing as a woman versus performing as a man. It just yeah. gives me curiosities. There was makeup and hair involved and, and corsets, <laughs> and also he was not a small person, he, like, I, I saw uh, one thing that said he was six feet tall and another that said that he was 5'9", but the 5'9 was talking about when he was doing his teenage roles. So, like, he he wasn't a petite person. Right. So, like, he was wearing these custom-made gowns that would would fit his rather large body and putting on corsets and on and off. It's, it seems exhausting to me. I would watch that part of the show. Can I pay to sit backstage and watch that happen? But this same year that we're talking about, before we went on our divergence on quick changes, uh, 1910, Elting became the highest paid male actor in the country with a contract that guaranteed him $3,000 a week. Producer A.H. Woods also offered him a contract plus $10,000 capital to start the Woods, Elting, and Bloom Theater Company. Construction on the Elting Theater on 42nd Street started in 1911. The Fascinating Widow opened on Broadway that year as well, running for 52 performances before going on tour. 52 doesn't sound like a lot in terms of today's Broadway schedule where shows will run for years and years and years and years. But at the time, that was a more successful run. Uh, The Elting Theater opened in 1912 after Julian had returned from touring with the fascinating widow. But by the time the theater was finished, he was drawing crowds that were just too big for the Elting Theater's 889 seats to handle. He never wound up performing at the theater that was named after him. He also eventually sold his share of the theater company back to A.H. Woods, saying that he liked being on stage a lot more than he likes trying to run things. Elting was at the height of his theatrical career, but the tone of his press coverage started to shift in the 19-teens. In 1910, most reviewers wrote about his flawlessly pulling off the illusion of femininity, the loveliness of his voice, and his skill at dancing. But over the next few years, more and more of his reviews were laced through with the idea that female impersonators were suspicious and that Elting stood out in contrast to them. One review ran in the New York Evening World that said, quote, There are a host of female impersonators, and those who are not abominations are pests. Elting is the exception. This media coverage reflected shifting social views. Gender roles were starting to shift in the wake of World War I, and as, as so often happens when social norms are starting to change, people who lived outside of those norms in one way or another were seen as, at best, suspect. So female impersonation was being seen less as a suitable form of entertainment, especially for women, and more as some kind of hint that a performer might be deviant in some way. Elting worked continually to combat this suspicion. On stage, he refused to take flowers when they were offered to him from the footlights because that would be too feminine. He also only took parts where there was some need for his character to cross-dress. The reasons for cross-dressing weren't necessarily wholesome. Sometimes it was to escape after having committed a crime, but it's not portrayed as just for fun or because he enjoys it. 
His 1915 role in Cousin Lucy is a good example. Written by Charles Klein with music by Jerome Kern, Cousin Lucy is a three-act musical farce about a man who fakes his own death and assumes the identity of his heir, that being Cousin Lucy. This play required Elting to make dozens of costume changes, with the costumes themselves being one of the most highly praised things about the show. But the reviews highlight what we've just been talking about. The October 1915 edition of the American Theater reads, quote, a considerable number of persons resent the appearance on the stage of female impersonators, and the more capable they are in presentation of female charms, vagaries, and foibles, the more deep-rooted becomes the prejudice. On the other hand, there would seem to be a still greater number who fairly batten on such anomalous fare. Julian Elting, the real leader in this curious form of art, has made a fortune imitating the fair sex. Offstage, Elting presented himself as abundantly masculine. He smoked cigars and boxed, including staging boxing matches for public display when he was on tour. There were also rumors that he started fights with anyone who dared to call him a sissy. This masculinity played a part in his marketing, too. His publicity photos always included pictures of him in masculine attire as his, quote, real self, in addition to the pictures of him in feminine costume. Sometimes posters and programs for the shows included both pictures together in one frame. In interviews, he also talked about how this was just an act, that he didn't enjoy wearing dresses, and that if he could make his living without doing female impersonation, he certainly would. Even though female impersonation was starting to be viewed with increasing distrust, Elting's biggest career move was still to come. And we're going to talk about Elting in Hollywood after a sponsor break. Julian Elting had become famous on stage in New York City. His name was so synonymous with female impersonation that it became shorthand for stage roles that involved cross-dressing, sort of like Timmy was cast in the Julian Elting role in the play. This made the research interesting as I was reading archival newspaper articles. There were all these results for Julian Elting that were really about other people being described as being in the Julian Elting role. This work, though, was really taking its toll on him. Most of his performances required numerous high-speed changes in and out of costumes, and his feminine costumes tended to involve corsets and layers and heavy gowns. And just doing that work under hot stage lights in theaters that didn't have air conditioning was exhausting. His most successful plays also went on tour after they closed their runs, making stops in cities large and small, and the travel itself was almost as physically demanding as the time on stage. So as films started to grow in popularity, the idea of starring in them wasn't just about potentially becoming even wealthier and more famous. It was about working on a schedule that didn't require 35 costume changes a night under hot lights. He wouldn't have to keep an entire show's worth of lines committed to memory or take his work on the road. He could limit his work to studios and sets and actually have time to rest between pictures. If he was working in film, he'd also have more time to devote to some of his other pursuits. There was a Julian Elting cosmetic line, which included a particularly popular cold cream. Keeping up that masculine appearance, there was also Julian Elting cigars. He published magazines, including Julian Elting's magazine of beauty hints and tips. One of these tips was that women should take up boxing to help improve their confidence. Elting was also a supporter of the movement for women's suffrage and a proponent of the idea that you should just lay off what other women are wearing. In a 1912 interview with the Boston Globe, he said, quote, let woman be happy in her own way. If she thinks she looks well with a barrel of false hair on her head, let her wear it. If she wants to powder, to paint, or to crowd a number two shoe on a six and a half foot, let her do it if she can. When a reporter rebutted that this hypothetical person might be making a caricature of herself, Elting answered, quote, possibly, but she doesn't know it. On the contrary, she believes she has added to her personal adornment. I repeat, let her go on thinking so, since it makes her happy. Spending more time in front of a camera instead of on stage gave Elting more time and more energy for all of this stuff that we've been talking about. 
He made his film debut with a cameo in How Molly Malone Made Good in 1915. In 1917, he signed a three-picture contract with Lasky Paramount Company. And all that touring that he had done with the stage performances really paid off. The huge audience that he had already established followed him directly to movie theaters, and for a time, he was a bigger box office draw than Charlie Chaplin. His films included silent adaptations of some of his stage work, including The Fascinating Widow. And in many, he had the starring role. He was Clifford Townsend, who disguised himself as the title adventuring woman in The Adventurous. In Made to Order, he disguised himself as a woman to infiltrate a gang of diamond smugglers. In Madam Behave, he was Jack Mitchell, who disguised himself as the aforementioned Madam when an important witness disappears during a court case. He also appeared in an all-star production of patriotic episodes for the second Liberty Loan with Mary Pickford, after which she nicknamed him Lady Bill. Combined with his stage work, Elting's work in film made him incredibly wealthy. After his death, the Associated Press reported that at his wealthiest, he'd been worth about $3 million. It was also during his time in Hollywood that he built his Los Angeles mansion, a Spanish colonial revival full of antiques called Villa Capistrano. This was one of several homes he owned on both coasts, and he lived there with his mother. Even at the height of his film popularity, he did do some work on stage, and he continued to be well-received, especially when he went back to the city where he got his start. One review from Boston in 1918 read, quote, Although it is a corking good bill all the way through, the program at Keith's this week, if deprived of all but the headline act, would fill the house. For the headliner is Julian Elting, native Bostonian, sometime member of the Boston Cadets and leading female impersonator in the world, who, after winning laurels on many stages and on the screen, is back for the brief space of a week on the stage where he made his professional debut. You wouldn't know it from that review, but the widespread suspicion of cross-dressing and female impersonation was really growing in the late 19-teens. The public, the media, and law enforcement began to conflate the idea of cross-dressing with the idea of homosexuality, which, at the time, was viewed as deviant. Homosexuality and cross-dressing became more and more entwined in people's minds, and more and more cities and states passed laws to ban both homosexual behavior and cross-dressing. In California, where Elting was living, so-called crimes against nature had been outlawed since 1850. The law was updated to name specific sex acts in 1915, and at the same time, police in California started raiding and breaking up drag parties, balls, and other events where people, especially men, cross-dressed, charging those arrested with, quote, social vagrancy. Elting managed to keep his stage and film career going in spite of all this social change. Through the 1920s, his movies were a huge box office draw, and he was still performing to sell out crowds at theaters all over the country. But then in 1930, he dropped from public view. The Motion Picture Production Code, a.k.a. the Hayes Code, was released that year. It was more formally, quote, a code to maintain social and community values in the production of silent, synchronized, and talking motion pictures. Under the heading of sex, number four was sex perversion or any inference to it is forbidden, and that included female impersonation. Elting had spent his entire life trying to completely separate himself from anything that might make anyone think he was, in the language of the time, an invert. If he had ever done anything to make anyone think that he was having a relationship with another man, his career would have been over immediately. We just had an episode on James Whale, who was, like, totally contradictory to this idea. He was an openly gay man at the same time as this. But... James Whale's career was not dependent upon him doing something that was already seen as suspicious in terms of gender. He was also not performing for the public. Like, as a director, he was removed from the public eye. So, Julian Elting never had a public relationship with anyone. He didn't even have close friendships with other men in his industry. When he died... Hundreds of people came to his funeral, but everyone who spoke at it could only really talk about his career. No one could talk about him as a person because no one really knew him. 
And it's not completely clear what Elting's sexual orientation was. Harry Hay was co-founder of the Mattachine Society, which was one of the first gay rights organizations in the United States back when the gay rights movement was known as the homophile movement. He told historian and author Daniel Hurwitz that Elting was involved with other men in a phone interview that he gave in 1997. But the creators of a documentary called Lady Bill, the Julian Elting story, give a totally different read of his life. In their project description at the New York Foundation for the Arts, they say, quote, it has taken years to uncover the threads of Elting's private life. But we have finally located family and relatives of friends, many of whom retained both his possessions and letters. Every bit of evidence points to the fact that Julian Elting was not a homosexual. In fact, fear of public condemnation transformed Julian Elting into a man with a distinctly asexual personality who poured his soul into the perfection of his art, which in the end, in spite of all his efforts to maintain its legitimacy, became the object of ridicule and hate. This makes his tragedy perhaps even greater. Regardless of the question of identity, same-sex relationships were suspicious at best when Julian Elting lived, and he made a lifelong effort to give the world absolutely no cause for suspicion. But that couldn't protect him from a rising tide of homophobia or from the perception that homosexuality and cross-dressing were absolutely connected. It also couldn't protect him from laws that were passed because of this perception. In other words, the Hayes Code meant that Elting could not work in film. The increasing existence of laws against cross-dressing meant that he could not work on stage either. All of this happened not long after the onset of the Great Depression, during which Elting lost most of his, his fortune. So he mostly disappeared for about a decade, during which time he struggled with alcohol abuse. In 1940, Elting tried to make a comeback. He was supposed to appear at Hollywood's Café Rendezvous in January of that year, but the police wouldn't let him in. When they finally did let him perform, it wasn't as a female impersonator. Instead, he wore a tuxedo with one of his dresses next to him on a mannequin. He performed the songs that he was scheduled to sing, and in between them, he described the dresses he would have had on if he had been allowed to do so. Back in New York, lyricist and producer Billy Rose had opened a nightclub called the Diamond Horseshoe in the Paramount Hotel in Times Square in 1938. And in 1941, he invited Elting to perform there. Elting did go on, but he became ill during a performance, and he was found dead in his apartment on March 7, 1941, at the age of 59. The cause of his death is not clear, and although he continued to be known as the greatest of all impersonators of women for at least a decade after his death, his name mostly faded from public memory. So to end on a slightly happier note, the Elting Theater still exists today. It became a burlesque house during the Great Depression, and when obscenity laws put an end to burlesque performance, it was made into a movie theater. It closed for a time, and then on March 2nd, 1998, it was moved a little more than 150 feet down 42nd Street from the 7th Avenue end of the block toward the 8th Avenue end. And there, it became the lobby of AMC Empire 25. During this move and restoration, conservators pieced together a mural that had been part of the original Elting Theater. It portrayed the three muses, and conservators' work involved reassembling the pieces of the mural, repairing some cuts and holes, and removing old paint. As they worked, they came to the conclusion that all three of the muses are Julian Elting, based on similarities to his appearance and demeanor and clothing in his publicity photos. So if you go to the AMC Empire 25 near Times Square, you can look up at the ceiling. That's probably Julian Elting looking back at you. That's so cool. Now I know what I'm going to do next time I'm in New York. <laughs> I kept looking. I was like, that's the theater right by where we always stay whenever yeah. <laughs> we're in New York for a thing. <laughs> So also, giant thanks to my friend Amy for loaning me the book Bohemian Los Angeles and the Making of Modern Politics by Daniel Hurwitz, which inspired this episode like maybe a year ago. Amy, I promise I'm going to bring this book back to you. The next time I see you, I have now had it for an embarrassingly long time. No one ever lend me anything. I think we all fall victim to that, especially, you know, in a, a job like ours where we're doing lots of reading, it's easy for books to get shuffled around on the priority list. And sometimes yeah. things don't make it back up for a year. It happens. Well, and I, 
I even, I had read the book. I had thought, I should do a podcast sometime on this Julian Elting person. Uh, and then I brought the book with me to return it to her and then left it behind by accident when we went to dinner. <laughs> and that, yeah, I'm just, I'm just not very responsible with other people's belongings, apparently. So that's the story of Julian Elting, though. Do you have listener mail for us? I do. This is from Erica. Erica says, thank you for your wonderful podcast. I found it several months ago, and it has made my commute and busy work portions of my job so much more enjoyable. I very much enjoyed your recent episode on Lotta Reiniger, especially the portion about her film, Prince Ahmed. I was immediately reminded of the Prince Ahmed character in Aladdin, which touches on the same stories. I wonder if that was a deliberate inclusion by Disney, perhaps as an homage to her pioneering work. It seems there are several references to her film in Disney's Aladdin, apart from the name itself, including the battle with Jafar as a giant snake. I am also reminded that I had meant to email you after I listened to the last Carolina Parakeet episode. In March, just one month after that episode aired, the last male northern white rhino died after months of failing health. He was named Sudan and living in a conservancy in Kenya which have been trying to save the species through breeding attempts, which failed. This leaves only two female northern white rhinos left in the world. Uh, both are there at the same conservancy. And the only hope for the species is advances in cell biology or cloning and rhino IVF. Listening to the fate of Lonesome George broke my heart, but I thank you for bringing more attention to the destruction of these subspecies thanks to human activity. Thanks again for all the fascinating topics. I always look forward to the next releases best Erica. I don't know if Holly has answers to the Aladdin question since that episode was her research. I don't have a definitive answer. I will tell you this, particularly after having worked on Drawn. The more people you talk to in the animation industry, the more you realize almost all of them really love animation history. Mm -hmm. So I would be shocked if that were not a purposeful direct reference. Oh, yeah. Cool. If you have not listened to Drawn, that is the podcast that Holly has been working on with Cartoon Network that is lovely. Why, thank you. Uh, and I, I, also I get to wanted... talk about cartoons, which is like <laughs> heaven. <laughs> and I also wanted to read this email because of the part about the last northern white rhino. That did seem to happen almost immediately after that episode came out, which is... Uh, that doesn't happen that often, but periodically we will put out an episode and then right after that something will happen that seems directly connected to what we just talked about. And so when that happened, we had a lot of people that were like, oh, did you hear about the rhino? Yes, we, it's a very sad story. So if you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, History Podcast, we're at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And we're also on social media as Myths in History. That is our Facebook and Pinterest and Instagram and uh, Twitter. And you can come to our website, which is missinhistory.com. Find show notes for all the episodes Holly and I have done together and a searchable archive of every episode ever. And you can find and subscribe to our podcast or Drawn at Apple Podcast, Google Play, wherever else you get podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. 